This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and my streaming service Nebula. Hey, happy Friday from North Berlin. This week we'll talk about the new Google Pixel devices, we'll talk about 4K maybe becoming a paid option on YouTube, and also about the brand new chip bands from the US. Welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, we'll start brief with some new announcements from Xiaomi, starting with the brand new 12T series. The 12T Pro has all the usual flagship specs, and its supposed standout feature is its 200 megapixel Samsung sensor. There is no Leica branding, so all the megapixels don't seem to inspire Xiaomi's confidence in its camera too much, and the 749 euro price tag is not bad, but still a bit of a bump from last year as well. Beside that, there is a new Redmi pad with a 90Hz display starting at 299 euros, which seems like a fine cheap tablet, and the Smartband 7 Pro, which went global for 99 euros as well. Next, the world's first laptop with a RISC-V processor became available this week, called the Alibaba Roma RISC-V laptop. It runs Alibaba's own Linux-based OS, and it uses a 12 and 28 nanometer quad-core chip. It's not cheap at $1,500, and there's only a hundred of them on sale initially, but at least it is a real RISC-V laptop. Then Google followed Meta's footsteps from last week and made its own text-to-video AI generators. The results are pretty spooky, but this is still somehow just so amazing to me. Not much later, Google also officially launched its 15,000 km long Equineo subsea cable connecting Europe and Africa. Google says data prices might drop between 16 and 21% in Africa as a result, and all it took was letting Google's backbone carry the world's data. Not bad. Then you probably saw that Elon Musk has told Twitter all of a sudden that actually he does want to buy them after all. Of course this seems to be mostly an admission of defeat as he unsuccessfully tried to break the offer and he also tried to unsuccessfully negotiate an offer trying to buy the company for 30% less, neither of which worked. At the time of writing this it's a little unclear whether Twitter is actually happy with the offer but the trial has been paused temporarily so we'll have to wait to see what happens. Meanwhile also this week Twitter Twitter actually built a TikTok clone into its own app, with infinitely scrolling full screen videos, because everybody seems to do that. Next, the NVIDIA 4090 went out to reviewers and it's apparently bigger than just an entire game console. And also here it is, photographed by Ars Technica next to a banana for scale. That is high class creative journalism right there. And finally, the day is also here where you can just buy a Steam Deck without the reservation. And it's available on Steam's own website in three editions starting at $399. Right, that's it for the brief. Links to all the newly announced products are down in the description, including to all the new Google stuff, which will be my first story of the week. My writer Tristan went to the event and tried all the new devices on my behalf, since I'm, as you can currently see, not in my usual place, and here are the first thoughts that we had. So first are the Pixel 7 and 7 Pro phones, and the really big deal for these two is their price and availability. Google not only kept their US prices basically the same, but they even kept those in Europe despite massive inflation. Now the wild thing here is that with the Euro being weaker than the USD, and the European prices including around 20% percent of VAT as well, it's now actually significantly cheaper to buy a Pixel 7 Pro in real terms, especially in Europe, than in the US. I've also heard that regional prices in other regions seem really nice as well, so I can't believe that I'm saying this, but it seems like we the people outside of the US are getting the better deal for once. Not only that, there are also aggressive pre-order bundles as well, with free Pixel watches and earbuds for example, which make the 7 especially insanely competitive in my opinion, and the phones are coming to 17 markets now instead of 12 too, including India and the Nordics, which is really nice as well. And unsurprisingly, Google is expecting results as well. It has doubled its launch order for the Pixel 7 apparently to as much as 8 million smartphones. That is still small potatoes for someone like Apple or Samsung, but it is kind of of impressive for Google. The hardware upgrades on the phones are pretty subtle, there's a slightly refined design, a slightly faster processor, a better modem from Samsung, a 5x periscope instead of a 4x on the Pro, a new selfie camera and etc. The Tensor 2 especially seems like a really minor upgrade, but Tristan and my studio mate Killian from Orbit tell me that the phone feels really great and smooth anyway, and all the little updates should add up to a much more polished phone. 
Then there's also a $350 Pixel watch, which I'm told it looks really good in real life. And it has nice haptic feedback, but with a tiny bit of stutter here and there. The watch uses an older Samsung processor, so maybe that is a worry, we'll have to wait and see. But there's also a Fitbit integration and strong sensors, so hopefully the thing should be decent as a fitness tracker too. And finally, Google also talked about its Pixel tablet, which looked interesting, but it's also coming out only in 2023, so kind of whatever. Still, I'm kind of positive about all the Google hardware. I think the prices are fantastic. I think the pre-order deals are fantastic. So yeah, this might have lags. Okay, and for my second story of the week, there might be a whole new set of US chip bands and a whole new set of ways for Chinese companies like Huawei to actually evade them. Specifically, the US government is thinking about blocking any US chip tech from China that is used for 14 nanometers or smaller in manufacturing. So anything that's been bleeding edge since like seven years or so. Previously, 10 nanometers or smaller were the target, so now we're kind of going upward to bend even more stuff. At the same time, the US is also planning to be stricter on blocking companies that supply chips for supercomputers in China too. And interestingly, this might not only hurt Chinese companies, but also companies like Samsung and SK Hynix, who manufacture memory chips in China. And in the meantime, Bloomberg reported that a secretive chip startup may help Huawei circumvent US sanctions. They're called Peng Xinwei IC Manufacturing Co. And they are run by a former Huawei executive. They are funded by Huawei and they're selling chips exclusively to Huawei as well, but they aren't officially part of Huawei, so they can get around the blacklists. The US government apparently knows this now and might do something about them, but you do have to wonder how porous some of these bans are, if you can just circumvent them by spinning out a company like that. Okay, and for my third story of the week, let's talk about YouTube running a test where they make 4K playback exclusive to premium subscribers. This was a test that came out after another one where YouTube put like 10 ads in front of a video and made everyone sort of go like, yeah, no thanks. It's important to note that both of these are just tests for now, but wow, do they seem comfortable with trying some pretty extreme stuff for trying to get people to subscribe to premium. And I can imagine that paywalling 4K must be a particularly tempting thing. The paywall would mean not just more premium subscriptions, but also fewer free users playing 4K videos as well, which would save them a lot of money. So it's kind of like a double benefit for them. And I think the first sign of this move was hiding the actual resolution options behind the generic words like higher quality on mobile instead of writing out the numbers. YouTube might be trying to abstract away resolution numbers from regular consumers. And for those people who do care about the resolution numbers, well, they'll try to get them maybe to subscribe to premium. It's kind of a risky move as there's few things that people hate more than things that were free becoming not free and being put behind a paywall, especially when it's coming from an ultra profitable company. And so I don't expect this to go down particularly well. That said, YouTube still doesn't have any real competition in the long form vertical video market and is only challenged by TikTok on shorts, so I guess they feel like they can risk it. And if you're wondering, premium revenue only makes up about 11% and 13% of the revenue on my two channels, despite paying more per user. So while I don't know if my channels are representative at all, I guess there is a lot more room for getting people to subscribe. I think putting 4K behind a paywall seems too much, but I mean, hey, I won't complain. I actually earn more from premium members as well. And it also makes our streaming service Nebula look even more ridiculously good. On Nebula, there is no 4K limit, of course. There are no ads, not even sponsored segments like this one. And instead, you get early access and lots of extra content. My next Tech Altar video, for example, is already up on Nebula with an extra bonus video as well that is exclusive to Nebula subscribers, while it's still waiting for some approvals here on YouTube. If you want to know why China smashed its own internet giants like Alibaba, you can watch it on Nebula first. Nebula is owned and run by many of YouTube's best educational creators, including me, so it actually supports us financially even more than watching us with YouTube Premium, even though it costs less to you as the viewer. Nebula comes for free when you get a subscription to CuriosityStream using my link in the description, and that only costs $15 for a full year. Two services for barely more than premium on its own for a single month. CuriosityStream is of course the best place to watch professional documentaries online. It hosts thousands of great shows about history, science, nature, space exploration, and more. And I think together with Nebula, it makes for the ultimate streaming bundle. Check them out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next week.